Hey guys, welcome back. This is Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports in Westfield, Indiana. You are watching Marksman TV. Today I have another weekly used gun review video for you. Remember in these videos, we take about eight used firearms that have come into the store and give you guys about a three to four minute review of each one to give you guys an idea of some stuff out there on the market. Remember the purpose of this video is strictly for entertainment and educational purposes only. I am not making this video to sell you anything, just to keep in accordance with YouTube's policies. Anyway guys, with all that out of the way, let's go ahead and jump into it now. All right, remember the format of these videos is we start off with most common and move through least common as we get through the videos. So starting off with spot number one, this is a Smith & Wesson M&P 45. Now these would come out onto the market in 2005. This particular gun, the 45 ACP variant, would come out in 2007. So the M&P line stands for military and police. These pistols would be the front runner of that line. Now you would have later variations like the shield is part of the M&P line, which was offered in nine and 40, the 380 bodyguard, and then of course the rifles like the AR-556 and the variations thereof. Now when these would first come onto the market, the price point would be about the five to 550 mark. Other things that were on the market at the time were things like the XD series from Springfield and then the Glock series. And around the early 2000s, many of you probably remember if you wanted a polymer frame gun with the, with the steel or the stainless steel slide, it was one of those three that you were picking up. And again, they were all priced in there in about the mid $500 range. Now in the Smith & Wesson line, the Sigma would lead, lead into this. The Sigma was a lot less expensive. They'd retail about three, 350 um, with a worse trigger. Uh, didn't really have a lot of good ergonomic features. They wanted to revamp their semi-automatic polymer frame pistol line with the M&P series by doing things like adding interchangeable back straps, putting in a better trigger, a trigger safety feature, which is like a hinge point that you have to pull. Not dissimilar to the Glock style with the little uh, kind of uh, flap that sticks out of the trigger face add nice stylizing slide serrations and things like that. So this actually was a very popular uh, pistol and would really get people into those debates between which of the three were really better. If you were in the M&P camp, the XD camp, or the Glock camps, this is kind of the, the, the uh, one of those three is what you were getting. Um, as mentioned, interchangeable back straps, accessory rail, magazines. They had different variations of magazines as demonstrated here. Now, a few years ago, they would come out with the 2.0 series where they had more aggressive grip texturing, a better finish, different slide finish, you know, things like that. Um, and those would take over that price point in about the five to 550 range. I think it was about two or three years ago that they, those came out. Since then, these have really come down in value and have really been a good buy. Now, of course, right now, everything's crazy on the used market and these are probably selling used, you know, in the four or $500 price point right now. But normally you could get the M&P series uh, first generation full-size polymer guns for like 250 to 300 dollars used um so always a really good bargain on these things i mean we i remember sticking these in our used gun case for like 249 or 250 or um sorry uh, 299 and they would just kind of sit for a while people wouldn't really pick them up but for two to three hundred dollars these are really a bargain for a home defense gun or a concealed carry or a truck gun or something like that uh, but again, right now the prices are elevated. So if you kind of hang out and wait, you know, these things should normalize back to the two to $300 price point eventually when everything gets back to normal. But anyway, uh, really cool pistols. We do get in a ton of these because a ton of these were made and sold. They're very, very popular. People, of course, over the years have traded them in to step up to the 2.0s or maybe get into different pistol lines altogether. But always been a winner, in my opinion, from Smith & Wesson. Always appreciated and enjoyed the M&P line, and I'm happy to get this one in here to show you as spot number one. Okay, up next is a very popular revolver from Ruger. This is the Ruger GP100 with the six inch barrel and the stainless finish. This one chambered in 357. Now they made these in 357, 327 Federal, 38 Special, of course, uh, 10 millimeter and 44 Special. I don't think I'm leaving any out there. Uh, they made these in a ton of different barrel lengths. The most popular would be two and a half, four and six, but there were some weird decimals in between there, like four and a quarter and, and other variations. So these have been produced for a long time, specifically since 1985, and would replace the Ruger Security 6 in its mid-frame mid size uh, revolver lineup. Since these have come out, these have been remarkably popular, competing with things like the Smith & Wesson 686, for example. Okay, what you're getting here, the Really big plus about these and what people tend to really really like them it, like about them is the durability and rugged build construction of these They are really belt heavy and like tanks 
And a lot of that goes into the manufacturing processes on how these are manufactured. It does have a transfer bar safety, a six round capacity in the cylinder, double single action with a very nice trigger, adjustable rear sights with a front post. Um, stylized, very, very nice, very comfortable grip. And if you are familiar with other Ruger Revolver products like the uh, Red Hawk series, for example, uh, something like this you're gonna feel right at home on. So it was a really nice addition to the Ruger lineup and their Revolver family. And this is probably one of the better selling revolvers that they put out on the market. Now, brand new, these would typically be in about the six, I'd say mid six to mid seven range. They have come out with different varieties of these, like the Tallow edition, uh, GP100s, and um, really I haven't seen a big distinguishing difference in the GP100s, the older ones versus the newer ones. I know I've had Yellow Box, a Yellow Box GP100 on here before. Of course, those in the original packaging are gonna go for more money. Used, you would typically find these like this, you know, with a non-factory box in this condition for about $400 to $500. Now, on the current market, these are going upwards of five to $600 again, which is, of course, crazy, like the pricing on everything else. If you're looking for something that is a good home defense revolver, uh, the GP100 especially, maybe something like a four inch barrel is great. If you're looking for something um, uh, for range and target use with a six inch barrel, just really nice balance and ergonomics. And again, if you're a fan of things like the 686, uh, this is something that I think would be a really good uh, comparable uh, revolver to get to put alongside that in your revolver lineup. So again, for the money, very, very well made guns, very highly regarded in the market, definitely worth taking a look at. Okay, up next I have a pretty cool little 22 rifle from Ruger, and that is the Ruger Precision Rifle 22 Rimfire. I'm gonna move this case out of my way and get you guys set up real quick. Okay, so a lot of you guys would remember that Ruger came out with the Precision Rifle in about 2017. They offer that in 308 and 6.5 Creedmoor. I think since then they've come out with larger caliber offerings, but those were actually a really, really, really cool rifle that came into the market and took precision rifle shooting uh, that part of the market by storm. It was a way to get a really nice quality bench, uh, long range precision, thousand yard potentially gun for about $1,200 into the marketplace and they were wildly good sellers. Uh, very, very popular when they came out and they still are. Now, about a year later in 2018, Ruger would come out with a Remfire version of the line, which is what you see here. They offered it in 22 long rifle, which is what this is, a 22 Magnum and a 17 HMR, and they had different finishing schemes and stuff like that. Now, the full rifle caliber versions of these, like I said, would retail around uh, the $1,200 mark. These would retail in about the low fives, high fours. Now, right now on the used market, of course, we all know, and I keep reiterating this, pricing is elevated on stuff like this. Pricing is not up super high. Um, seeing these sell used for about the uh, $400 price point. Yeah, about, you know, again, a year or so ago, you should, be, should have been able to pick one of these up for about maybe 50 to 100 bucks cheaper. Now, cool things about this is it does take the detachable 10 round rotary or the BX25 magazines that also fit in the uh, 1022 series of rifle or the American uh, bolt action rifle series too. Ruger's always been good about cross use of their parts and their accessories and magazines and things like that. So that's all there. Has the same bolt throw, bolt stylizing and bolt handle on the larger American. In fact, the overall design and layout of the gun is, is identical to the precision rifle the Ruger Precision Rifle uh, that we had discussed. A really nice stock that has an adjustment comb. You can change the positioning and the height of that. Uh, QD sling points, the nice Accu trigger, um, M-lock mounting points, and a threaded barrel. So again, for what would be new, typically about $450 to $500, a really cool package in the Rimfire uh, options for pre precision shooting. Other things similar to this on the market would be like the CZ457 or even the CZ512 that you guys saw um, in a, one of these weekly used gun reviews that I did the other week. Um, but anyway, really, really nice. Just a Bench 22, and these are super accurate. We've sold several of these through our store, and our customers who have bought them new and used have always just uh, said just how great the accuracy is on them. Um, free floated, heavy contour barrel, nice trigger, nice grip, nice stock. I mean, again, for the price point, it is a rim fire, okay? So you can get, you know, a 1022 or something like that for cheaper. But if you really like the idea of going out and shooting inexpensive ammo, especially with what's going on right now, to get as precise as you can, you know, 100 to 300 yards, you know, something like that with a 22 long rifle, really try and stretch it out. This is really the way to do it. So just a really cool option, a cool platform, very comfortable and ergonomic. Definitely recommend taking a look. Okay, up next I have yet another one from Ruger. So a lot of Rugers in this.
this video. This is a Ruger SR556 AR15. Super, super cool. Process. Try and get this out of here. There you are. All right, let me get this out of your way real quick. The Ruger SR556, this thing looks super clean. Now, this would come out onto the market in 2009. It is a gas piston operated AR-15 and really at the time, as far as attainable commercial level consumer AR-15s that were gas piston driven, was still a pretty new concept and there were not really a whole lot of options out there. Now, this is the SR-556. That's the name would suggest chambered in 556. They also made these in 300 blackout. There was also the SR762, which was the AR10 variant in 762x51 or 308. It is a standard AR15, you know, collapsing stock. Uh, it does have a top rail section here and gas piston operated with the Ruger style birdcage flash hider. Known for reliability, also known for their lightweight for being a gas piston gun. Of course, one of the many drawbacks on a gas piston in an AR-15 variant is you are gonna have a little bit more weight and complexity and parts right up here at the front end, but it is driving a piston rod to cycle the action rather than being direct impingement, which is what most ARs are. I know there's like, they're not technically direct impingement, but we'll just say they're direct impingement for argument's sake in this video, where you're letting gases directly bleed into the receiver, causing a lot more fouling a lot more stuff that you have to clean up. Um, just overall, really cool design. And these were not overly expensive for what they were, typically retailing at about the $1,000 to $1,200 price point is where you would find them. Now in 2016, these would be discontinued for a different version called the Takedown, which I believe was discontinued again in 2018. But the Takedown version was like this, but it did have a, uh, a key mod rail section up here. It was lighter weight, and as the name would suggest, it would take down. You'd take off the lower receiver, and then the barrel would have a quick detach mechanism from the receiver, and it would all fit into a, uh, a little bag about the size of the 1022 Takedown bag. So you could really take it with you anywhere and have a good uh, piston-driven AR-15 uh, that you could really take with you into a hotel or anywhere that you know could sort of disguise what it was uh, If you needed to travel with it or anything like that keep it in a vehicle. So really really cool concept there now on the used market These are not bringing a super high amount of money compared to a lot of other AR-15s These are uh, hovering around you know the 12 to 1300 dollar price point um, as mentioned, this one is in like new condition in its original uh, carry bag and original cardboard box. So I'd expect that this would probably go on the higher end of that around the 13 mark. So just very nice and ergonomic. Now, as many of you guys would know, in 2014, Ruger would came out, come out with the AR556, which is just direct impingement. And that has really been a staple in the uh, Ruger lineup. You know, that AR15 was very popular. It was probably a reason why these were discontinued just because sales on the AR556 have always been so strong. When anybody's ever looking for an entry level AR, it's the AR556 or the MP15 Sport that everybody gravitates to. So those have been very, very popular and probably, again, led them into the decision to just get rid of these and then come out with the DI guns, uh, the AR556. So. A really, really cool rifle. Definitely, if you like uh, gas piston operated firearms and you want one at a, you know, from a reputable company at a good price, finding one of these used. You know, again, right now I know prices are elevated, but still $1,000 to $1,300 for a gas piston operated AR 15 in today's market is not bad at all. So, just really, really cool SR556. All right, up next I have not one, not two, but three Norinco Model 213 Tokarev. 9mm pistols. Now, the TT-33 Tokarev would be designed and issued in Russia's military around World War II. First the uh, TT-30 and then would come with the development of the TT-33, which I believe, let's see, I don't know if very many of the TT-30s ever saw service, but the TT-33 was used uh, widely. I actually have one of those myself made in 1939. So really, really cool pistols chambered in 762 by 25 which is subsequently also used by their submachine guns. Now China, uh, more specifically Norinco, would come up with a clone of that design and would market it to the U.S. civilian market in 9mm because 9mm ammunition was way more plentiful on the market. Um, 
it's funny because in the, you know, the mid to late 80s, things like this that were coming in from Norinco and Polytech, like SKSs, even the AKs, which now are like worth their weight in gold. I mean, you could get a Polytech AK back then for 250, adjusted for inflation, it might be around $500, four or $500. Today, you know, Polytech AKs are selling, you know, in the two to $3,000 price point. So similar sort of thing with these. These were not very expensive coming in, new in the box like this. I'll open up another one here from China. You know, you maybe would have paid about $100, $180. Uh, these, of course, original in their boxes. Now, in 1989, of course, there was the importation ban from places like China, and these would stop coming into the country, and very quickly thereafter, their pricing would start to go up. Now, on today's collector market for Tokarevs, most people like the 760 by a 25 variant, and there are a ton of them. I mean, they've come in from Romania, they've come in from Yugoslavia. Uh, and they really have maintained a price point of around the $300, $250 to $300 price point. And really, these are no different. Uh, even in their original boxes, uh, I'm seeing these, you know, on Gunbroker and other places selling at about the $300 to $350 price point. So, so they are really cool. They really don't have a lot of collector appeal for like military arms collectors. But for people who like that nostalgic stuff uh, from the 1980s, those old Norinco firearms, these are still an interesting purchase. Also, if you like the idea of an inexpensive uh, copy of a military firearm and you would like it in 9mm rather than the 7.62x25 Tokarev, uh, this is a good option as well. A lot, I should say, it's kind of funny, not, not really right now. Funny side note, I had 7.62x25 ammo. My 9mm pricing is now up to $25 a box because my wholesalers doubled their pricing on me. I had a uh, customer, actually, a uh, uh, the Wabbit season, uh, Jeff, who I've had on the channel before, but he came in and I had a couple boxes of 7.62x25 Tokarev at $23 a box. So I never thought I would see the time when 7.62 ammo was, uh, you know, 7.62x25 ammo is cheaper than 9mm. But the philosophy here was is that hopefully when 9mm comes back, if it does, that it would be cheaper to shoot. So just, it's still a very, very cool firearm with a, you know, import history. Uh, cool to get these and they of course all came from the same seller so uh very very nice always love to get tokarev pistols makarovs anything like that so very cool okay up next i have a very iconic carbine if i can figure out how to even work this case here this is the chris vector this one here is in 10 millimeter get this case out of the way oops okay chris vector so research and development on this product would begin in about 2006, 2007, and it would hit the market in 2009. Now the Chris Vector is really well known uh, for its fully automatic counterpart, submachine gun variant, if you will. But of course, us being lowly peasants, we can enjoy the semi-automatic versions of this. Of course, they make post-sample Chris Vectors. You could probably rent at a machine gun shoot or something like that. Now these were offered in nine, and this is between the semi-automatic and the full auto uh, variation. Uh, 9x19, 9x21, 40, 45, 10mm, and 22. As I mentioned, this is a 10mm, and most of these that you're going to find are going to be either in 45 or 10. That's the most popular caliber. Now, what makes this popular in a higher caliber, such as a 45 or a 10, and if you've ever shot a 45 caliber submachine gun like a Thompson, which is about double the weight of this, um, you're going to notice that even on a 45 ACP, you're going to get a lot of climb. What they decided to do is make a, uh, a recoil system. It is a close bolt um, and it's going to travel backwards and then there is a link in the bolt which causes it to change its trajectory and head down into this compartment here. So your recoil motion is like this. When you're at the full travel of recoil, all of your mass is headed in a downward motion which changes your inertia uh, direction from typically what is lateral to down. So that's, as you're firing, of course, your muzzle is climbing. That is keeping your muzzle pointing down. It's a very uh, ingenious design, and it actually works. I have never fired one of these in fully automatic, but if you watch people who shoot them, and these things are, I mean, their selling machines are like 1,500 rounds a minute. Uh, and, you know, they have the, I think they fire in a burst configuration as well. Uh, but if you watch people shoot them, they can actually do mag dumps out of these with, without the muzzle really climbing at all. I have shot these in semi-automatic, and I mean, it really feels like uh, the recoil impulse is negligible. Of course, that's going to be much more um, obvious if you're shooting in a fully automatic function with that high uh, RPM. But um, you know, even in some automatics, very, very controllable. Now, they make these in a rifle and a pistol configuration. This is, of course, the rifle configuration with its original stock and an extended sort of fake 
uh, uh, you don't want to say can or suppressor. What you have out here is a 16 inch barrel. You got to have that unless it's going to be an SBR. And instead of having a goofy looking thin profile barrel sticking out here, they just covered it in a fake suppressor to make it look at least a little bit cooler. Because it is a rifle, it can have a vertical grip as well. It is a very interesting and weird feel when you're shooting. It is very untraditional, but still really not bad and definitely usable. Glock magazines, so Glock 20 magazines. Just really breaks up the traditional lines of what you're gonna see in something like this, but makes it also very iconic. Now, price point on these. Typically brand new, here in about the $1,500 to $1,600 price point. Used, I haven't seen the market really change on these. 12 to 13 has been standard on these used, and it continues to be standard on them used now. Um, I don't know if the market is just not as excited about things like this. Um, I've had a couple of them used. In fact, I've had one of these Chris Vectors in 45 on an earlier one of these videos. But whatever, for whatever reason, the market is just not, uh, doesn't seem to be as interested in these and it's not really uh, climbed uh, due to the gun shortages. So uh, you can pick one up for about what they used to go for used. You can get them cheaper than what they sell for new. So definitely if you like this design, if you like the sort of the weird ergonomics and you do want a pistol caliber carbine in either you know, 9, 45, 10 millimeters, something with really light recoil impulse, and that yes, does take Glock magazines, this is something that should not be overlooked. Very cool package, definitely worth taking a look at. Again, not going to compare to other things like the PC carbines or the AR-15 pistol caliber versions or the sub-2000s in terms of price point, but it is definitely something different for that person who's got everything and wants to just round out the collection with something unique like a Chris Vector. So anyway, we got that for you. Okay, up next is a pretty interesting little pistol from Colt. This one comes from the 80s. Um, I'll pull this out of here for you. Original box, paperwork, and all that. This is a Colt government model, series, uh, I'm sorry, Mark IV Series 80 uh, government model, and this was chambered in 380 ACP. Now, this would come out at the head of the big 380 pocket pistol boom in about, you know, the 70s, 80s, when that was getting very popular. What Colt essentially did is they took their basic 1911 design and they scaled it down by about 25% and came up with uh, what you see here. So it's, it's basically component-wise very, very directly related to the mechanics of a 1911. Now you don't have things like a grip safety and other sort of mechanical features like that that you would find on the full-size gun, sort of to give it the iconic look and feel, and it's actually very nice feeling, uh, you know, sort of appeal of their mainline pistols. Now, many people would say this looks like a Colt Mustang. Well, the Colt Mustang was the next in the design changes that would come through in uh, 1986. Of course, that's when the Mustang would come out. In 1987, they would have the alloy version of the Mustang. The Mustangs are really what popularized uh, this concept. So this is really an early iteration of that design uh, theory with the 380 and the 1911 frame from Colt. Now, new in the box, this would come with one seven round magazine. This one here has a second one also branded from Colt. Uh, I don't know, and I couldn't find any detail on what the retail price on these was new back in the 80s. They were probably around the four or $500 point that I could assume. Uh, like this and like new condition in its original packaging, they're going slightly below a thousand, maybe eight, nine hundred dollars So uh, not as wildly collectible as, you know, of course their revolver line and even their 1911 line, still because it is a 1980s cold in its original packaging. It does have that nice nostalgic appeal. Of course, again, because the pocket carry market, the small 380s and this sort of size and feel um, will lead into other popular designs that are out on the market today, like you know the SIG 938s, the 238s, and even the Springfield 911s. But things like this is kind of where it all began. Uh, a lot of people went out and bought things like this. And so, you know, of course, you always have that collector appeal of going out and getting something that you used to have back in the 80s. So very nice, functional, lightweight for what it is. Uh, the Mustang, of course, would make changes on its overall design, size, and weight. And that's, again, what made the Mustang very popular. It's even, uh, even smaller and lighter than this package here. Uh, so very, very cool pistols. Love getting stuff like this in. Retro Classic Colts. Uh, I've got another one coming up for you guys. But yeah, there is the Colt Government 380. Okay, last but not least, I have another retro offering from Colt in the original box. This is the Colt 1911 Officers. ACP in the bright stainless finish. Very, very attractive gun. Um, chambered in 45 ACP. Now the story on this would really start in the mid-70s, about 1975, when the military would come out with a general officer's sidearm, which was a three and a half inch version of the standard 1911. Now, of course it was popular within the military, but did not see any type of commercial use. We're not manufactured for the commercial market, and no commercial 1911 manufacturers had a variation of the officer's 1911. Um, 
Following into about the early 1980s, the Tonics would actually come out with their own version of a scaled down or a shortened barrel, and I should say 1911 with a three point out, uh, three and a half inch barrel, and it was widely popular on the market. People who could not afford or did not want to buy or could not find one of those available would just basically, a lot of people would take their full size government 1911s, take them to private gunsmiths, and have them attempted to be scaled down to a three and a half inch barrel, which would get you this sort of package. So it is a really concealed carry 1911 variation. Following in 1985, Colt, noticing that there was a lot of demand for something like this, would come out with this handgun, the Officer's ACP, a 45 ACP Officer's Bottle, 1911, three and a half inch barrel. It was a Series 80. In the Series 80, you can tell you're looking at it. If you pull the slide back, you're going to see a little safety plunger right there. It is a firing pin block. When you pull the trigger, that plunger is pushed up and out of the way, allowing the firing pin to drop. It does add a little bit of stacking to the trigger. And most 1911 collectors do prefer the Series 70, which came before this, which did not have that style feature in there. Now this and the bright stainless in its original box, it does have its original grips here. Pack Myers are installed on this one. Uh, you know, something like this, $1,200 to $1,500. So they are very popular. They are very desirable, beautiful handguns. Sorry about that, somebody just came in. But yeah, even as a Series 80, um, having a nice place in history is being Colt's sort of introduction to the officer model handgun and being an early part of the officer model uh, 1911 sort of uh, uh, genre of firearms as it is anyway, is just really cool, nostalgic and interesting. So uh, anyway, really, really happy to get this in. This is actually the second officer's ACP I've ever had in here. Um, that one was not as in good condition and did not have its original box. And I wanna say it sold for like seven or eight $800 so uh, with its original box and everything yeah just a, a little bit over a thousand so super super cool pistols very very nice good triggers definitely recommend uh, taking a look at one if you see one if you're a Colt collector so there is the last one there for you for this week's weekly used gun review well, that is all the time I have for you today on these. Thank you so much for stopping by and checking out this video. If you enjoyed, please let me know by hitting that like button. Also, please consider subscribing to my channel as I do post these videos every single week. Anyway, guys, I'm going to leave you off there. I am Chris with Marksman Shooting Sports in Westfield, Indiana. You are watching Marksman TV. I will see you next time.